This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, host of the original Southern Remedy, the show where I answer your medical questions. Subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on any podcasting app. Good morning and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking and I am Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. We'll be covering a few of the emails that we've received over the last few months. The topics include anything from emotional contagion, anxiety, hoarding, ADHD, forgiving, and and a couple of other things. There were just some great comments and questions and thoughts that um, Abram and I thought were worth you hearing um, that are from our listeners, just like you, about some of the previous shows. Um, You can hear those shows in their entirety on your favorite podcast app after this show if we pique your interest. So as we go over each call um, that I think is very thought-provoking, or each email rather, Um, we'll reference the show that we pull these from. And I want to thank Abram because I'm using the collective we. My husband says I'm guilty of that. But but actually, Abram, you're the ones who pulled, who took the time to pull these calls. So I appreciate you. Yeah, I finally have access to that email address. So now that when we say uh, email family at mpbonline.org, we've actually, I'm actually getting them now. So sorry about that, everyone. We've got them. We've got them now, and we will be answering your emails um, as we can, but I will also say that hopefully, um, as you email us, you'll you'll let us hear back from you about, um, you know, whether or not you want us to put it on the show or not, um, and whether or not the the show was helpful or the email answer was helpful. Okay, well, let's jump into our first call because I thought it was uh, a good one that actually sort of touched on a couple of our shows. The one um, that this this email came from was emotional contagion or contagion, however you like to say it. That was back in November 7th of 2023 last year. And so the email actually came before the next show that seemed to help me make a point. The New Year's resolutions that will survive, the one we did on January the 2nd, 2024. This person, I think, managed to make one of her intentions for the New Year stick. And so, so let's, let's go to this. And I've, Abram, if he would read the questions so you don't just hear my voice the entire time. So the the show Emotional Contagion on November 7th, 2023. Abram? Yes, ma'am. Uh, she starts off saying, uh, she, sorry, you're late. we enjoyed the show. Um, the Really, she gets into it and she says, here's my nightly meditation for keeping a handle on my emotions, which since the death of my husband recently have been on a real roller coaster and it seems to help even the keel, so to speak. And this is a poem from Laura Jean Thurman that she keeps as a, as a meditation for herself. She says, keep my anger from becoming meanness. Keep my sorrow from collapsing into self-pity. Keep my heart soft enough to keep breaking. Keep my anger turned toward justice and not cruelty. Remind me that all this, every bit of it, is for love. Keep me fiercely kind, which she adds in parentheses is her favorite line. Many thanks, and keep up the great, relatively important work. And that's from, I think it's uh, either Jan or Jane Swearington. Yeah, I think think Jan is correct. Jan. Um, I thought that was beautiful because if if you think about it, um 
what she's trying to do is keep her emotions in a useful direction, right? Um, keeping it from transmitting to others things that she does not want to transmit. I think as we think along, anger is really okay, right? As long as you are not mean from it, it's okay to be angry about something egregious that happened to someone. And it's okay to be sorrowful and sad as long as you're not moving into something that's not useful, like self-pity. Obviously, that's not. And so on. I think so. I, I think that piece that she uses is sort of a mindful meditation to keep her centered in doing doing the right thing. So, you know, whether it's joy or tranquility or fear, or anger or sadness, we as human beings are really wired to literally catch emotions um, and and give emotions. And so I think as as she was talking, that emotional emotional contagion is it's important for us to remember that we're aware of what it is and how we sometimes need to make a conscious decision so that we make changes in our lives so that whatever the, ever those emotions are that we are catching or emitting are the right ones. And I want to go a little bit further on that. Elaine um, Hatfield, I talk about in the podcast on emotion, emotional contagion, and, and she actually basically created uh, the term. And, and she notes that there's a tendency to automatically mimic and synchronize your facial expressions, vocalizations, postures, movements of of those uh, people around you. And so are you so you if you're around them a lot, sometimes you almost converge emotionally. And I think that's really interesting. And so um, we'll get to another caller who sort of mentioned this again later in the show. But on this one, I think what we need to to just keep in mind is um, so many times if you're around someone who is negative emotionally, you will find yourself feeling more ne negatively emotional. And I know many of you are thinking of someone who is very positive in your life and you love for them to walk into the room because almost instantly that individual is uplifting. So just a quick suggestion here. It's really important to make sure you're around the right kind of people. There's research on emotional contagion over the last several years that looks at how how it can affect you. And interestingly enough, even on social media, um, there have been studies that have found viewers readily catch the emotion of popular YouTube bloggers. Um, when viewers see something really positive, they react in a way that heightens their positive emotions. And the same pattern holds through for people who have negative post and and absorb those negative emotions so keep that in mind um, I want to remind you that uh, certainly the contagion effect is more um, firm so to speak if you're physically around someone because you're really looking at all of their body language and their facial expressions and whether they're leaning forward or back or crossing their arms or not. But even online, the, the television, social media, uh, even radio, all of that can either bring you up and uplift you or, or let you down, so to speak. So if you need more information on emotion, 
Emotional Contagion, uh, go to that podcast and take a look. Listen, I think you'll enjoy it. There were several other good callers on that. Okay. Now, I want to shift to what I think she was saying about the New Year's resolutions. Um, she resolved that she was going to do this daily meditation to keep herself in a positive way. Okay. She did not say that that was one of her New Year's resolutions. I'm just saying that that would have been a beautiful resolution. Okay. We make... New Year's resolutions for a lot of reasons, but the most common reason is that we want to change something in our lives, about us, in our relationships, you know, the way we look or act or how we care about ourselves or um, how we approach issues, right? Yeah, and when we, we said in the New Year's resolution show, you know, you can't start too big with these New Year's resolutions, and this is a good, smart goal to start with, saying... For my resolution, I want to meditate this over myself every night. Yes, that is exactly right. And so I guess my invitation to our listeners, thank you for that, Abram, because that's exactly the point. It was small. It's something small. It takes less than 60 seconds to do that meditation. But if you do it every day, it recenters you and helps you. So. We're still very early in the new year, so my call to you now is is to, if you are sort of faltering on your new, new Year's resolution, ratchet it down a bit, pull it a little bit tighter, make it something that you can do um, in tiny baby steps, and um, pull it back in. It's okay if you faltered a little bit. Maybe take whatever you resolved and make it in a smaller step so that now um, it's not quite as uncomfortable or not quite as difficult so that you can you can kind of start over. <laughs> so I think she came up with a great meditation. One that can keep recentering her on those emotions that she wants to emit. And ultimately, it'll it'll make a hard, fast, hard wired change, which is our goal when we want to change in the positive direction. Thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Abram Nanny. And today we're talking about several different emails of different flavors about ADHD, about forgiving, about hoarding, and other other things. Um, and, and I just want to remind everybody, as we said at the beginning of the show, that if you have emailed us in the past and you did not hear from us, um, please take heart. We were having a little bit of difficulty accessing the emails. We've got it now and we'll be responding. And I'd love to put some of them on the show as we are doing on now, uh, as we are doing right now. So um the the first one uh, we talked about was emotional contagion and New Year's resolutions. And now we're going to move to sort of a two-part show that we did back in September, on September 19th and 26th of 2023. And they were about the act of forgiving, forgiving um, others. Very important to learn how to do, because if you don't, it eats away at you. But also forgiving yourself, um, because if you don't, it can be self-destructive. And um, I'm going to now turn it back over to Abram. I've asked him if he'll read the emails. This email is from Will. So go ahead, Abram. All right. It says, Dear Dr. Buttress, my name is Will. I live in Jackson and work as a rural mail carrier in Pearl. I listen to your show on my route. So thank you for that, Will. I had a couple of thoughts about your last show. When I went through my first divorce in 1996, Don Henley's song, Heart of the Matter, really helped me during that difficult time. You can Google the lyrics. It's about a man that learns his ex is with someone else. Later, I learned some history of this song. 
Don Henley and Glenn Frey were in one of the greatest bands of all time, the Eagles. They broke up because of differences between the two. When they were asked if they would ever get back together, they always answered, when hell freezes over. After Henley recorded this song, it prompted him to call Frey. They began to talk again and eventually reunited 14 years later. The album they released was titled Hell Freezes Over. One thing I would like to add from your Tuesday show, I find it easier to forgive others than it is for me to forgive myself. I think it is important for people to know that. I enjoy your show. Thank you for making my days better. Will. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. I hope you're listening today. Um, I think you just had some beautiful insight into several things. And if everybody stays uh, tuned at the next break, we're going to play a little part of Heart of the Matter. I listened to the entire lyrics very closely. And I think Will is right. And you can understand um, as you listen to the lyrics, the the importance of um, what what um, Henley and Frey were talking about when they recorded this, or Frey rather, I mean Henley. That was Henley recording it, and they got back together. Okay, interestingly enough, by the way, I don't know if y'all have heard on the news that there is some some issue going on with some of David Henley's. Um, writings that was just in the news. Apparently, they went on auction and apparently were stolen. So follow that story, too. That was interesting. Okay. So we we did a, a show this past January uh, 24th um, on self-forgiveness. And um, the truth is that it is often more difficult for someone who is very caring and sensitive to forgive themselves. Um, and, and I'll come to that. You know, most of us have trouble really living in the present. What we do is we look back in the past about the mistakes we made. We find sadness in the loss we may have caused and are um, upset or anger in something that other people have done or done to us. And then we'll move briefly through the present. Sometimes we live there for a little bit, but often then we turn and we worry about the future. And so you've got to learn to let go of the past or the past that maybe we even created in our minds because sometimes the past that we remember we blow up the negative and, and forget some of the positive. There's some people out there who do that. And so you want to be careful about making sure that that the the, the past that that is is there, you can remember it, but don't expand on it and don't don't live in it. And sometimes it can feel difficult or impossible if we don't have a good, clear understanding of what's going on with us. And one, while sometimes we create that false narrative, part of the problem may be that when we try to forgive ourselves, for example, we're, we're trying to release what we've created as who we are and what we did or experienced. You know, when we're, forgiving others, it may be easier because we are releasing part of the past that really did not define us, who we are. So um, I know sometimes we also, though, have trouble forgiving others. And, um, and I think that if we all allow ourselves to learn how, to forgive others, it'll make us make it easier for us maybe to forgive ourselves. Um, and also remember that until you fully forgive someone, you really are not able to, to heal. And I think that's something hard that Many times, I mean, even in the the worst acts, and I always come back to the the time um, 
when several children in an Amish school were killed um, by a gunman who was caught. And if you all remember, this was several years ago, but the, the Amish community, the parents of those children, openly and outwardly forgave the individuals who killed their precious children. And um, to me, that was one of the most profound messages that I have ever received, is how important and powerful individuals who want to have peace in their lives and caring and love in their lives feel about the need for forgiveness. So, you know, remember that the the key is we have to learn to retain any lessons that we learned from the event because that's good. You know, mistakes that we make, egregious acts that others do to us typically have something in there that we can learn from. Maybe something in there, even when it was a terrible act. Is there something that perhaps you've learned? So retain whatever the lesson. And then you have to learn how to release everything else. So if we register what we've done wrong mentally and physically, back to self-forgiveness, which Will said is the hardest thing to do, and it is. If we register back what we've done wrong mentally and or physically, whatever injury that was to someone else, and and register that guilt and and then realize it was a mistake and then Resolve that you learn from that mistake, that you learn from the sadness that it caused or the hurt that it caused to other people, and then realize that you have to forgive yourself for that, get rid of that guilt, release it, and then Allow yourself to be forgiven so that you can then move forward in life, learn from that lesson, and be able to do good. And perhaps doing something good for someone else um, will help you move forward. So, Abram, I don't know if you have any thoughts or comments on that. I I just, I think we went so in-depth previously in the show uh on the what was it september 9th and 26 um right. it, i think it was hard to kind of remember to take a step back and say yeah forgiveness is gonna make myself like forgiveness is the first step in healing and i think we uh, at least for myself i i kind of miss that myself is that forgiveness is so much of a benefit to yourself let alone for uh, you know, the relationship, it just, it's a benefit for your own, uh, mind and for your own sake. It, it really is. And it's something that we just have to learn how to do, forgive others, forgive ourselves. And that way our lives will feel better and be better. I am Dr. Susan Buttress. And today we're going over several wonderful emails that we've received over the last few months. And I hope you'll keep sending them in if you don't have time to call in. Um, today we're mostly taking emails, but I understand we have Brother Daniel on the line. And Brother Daniel, we'll pull you in now um, for a short call because I want to make sure we get to all of our other emails. But thank you for calling. Yes, how y'all doing? Real quick, two minutes. Um, I just want everybody to understand, Mississippi, I want us to learn from the, those uh, brothers and sisters that forgave them people for killing their children. Mm. That was a hard thing to come by. And we must remember, I wish we could pass this on to Israel and understand the situation. They did what Jesus would do. Are we really loving people like Jesus loved us? Are we really showing what love is about and not being caught up in the violence and hate? L let us share 
the love so that the rest of the world can see that America is back doing the right thing and showing love to the world. Let's not get caught up in this bickering, this politics stuff. Let's understand what we're going through is only a temporary situation and that we can get through it. That's how Mississippi will run. And I'm so proud of the governor today on him making some changes. I I just want to tell him I'm so proud of you, brother. Follow as Jesus would do. Thank you. Beautiful, Brother Daniel. As always, you have great messages. And and I think you're right. Um, those, those of us who profess Christianity need to remember what we're supposed to be about. Other religions really, really are the same. Okay. Um, thank you. Forgiveness. All right. Now we're going to switch. Um <laughs> Pretty significantly, um, we did a show on hoarding, and and as as many of you may know, hoarding kind of falls under the umbrella of anxiety disorders, but not exactly. It's very complex and interesting. And um, we did that show on September twelfth, twenty twenty three, and and I know. You may think, some of you listeners may think this is a rare disorder, but it is not. It is something that I bet there's someone around you who is a hoarder and is probably struggling with it terribly. And so um, we did receive an email um, from an assistant professor at the Department of Psychology at Mississippi State University, um, Dr. Mary Dozier. And um, Abram, even though I've been having you read these, I think I'll go ahead and, and read over this one because I just received an email, I'm excited to say, um, about a study that she is doing. She had emailed me back then. She said, I'm currently running an NIH-funded clinical trial to treat older adults with hoarding uh, disorder using an in-home behavioral intervention. And she had listened to the Southern Remedy episode on hoarding and wanted to reach out and uh, make sure that that we as a state knew that this was um, something. So I'm going to read the email that she sent in uh, this morning because I just said, Mary, I wanted to know if this show, if, if this study is still going on or this clinical trial rather. And she said, yes, the clinical trial will be recruiting through early 2025. I am happy to come on your show if you'd like, and I may bring her back later on. Uh, she says Project Reclaim is a free program from Mississippi State University from adults age 60 and over. And this is a disorder that typically affects older individuals, by the way, listeners. The program is designed to help individuals age in place by decreasing household clutter Participants are assigned to a clinician who comes to their home once a week for 16 weeks to help them declutter. The program involves discussing motivations to keep and discard objects, practicing sorting and discarding with the help of the clinician. Participants are also asked to complete monthly assignments to help with the program evaluation and they're provided with a $20 Walmart gift card for completing each assignment for a total of $100 across the four-month participation. And um, the project Reclaim is sponsored by the National Institute of Health and is recruiting participants for the next 12 months. And so this is by Dr. Mary Dozier, and she's left her phone number, and I'm going to give that out right now. It's 662-325-0523. I'm going to repeat it again. 662-325-0523. 0523. Okay. 
um, listeners, I just want to let you know, this is an amazing opportunity to have someone help in home with someone who is a hoarder. So I would like to implore you, if you know anyone who is trapped in this hoarding issue, to see if you can get them to agree to enroll in this clinical study uh, by the National Institute of Health at Mississippi State University because um, it is very difficult to come by this kind of um, treatment. And I, I think to get someone enrolled, it, it's 60 and over. So keep that in mind. But to enroll someone, I think would be a wonderful thing if you could. So Dr. Dozier, thank you so much for your quick response. I appreciate it. And and I will be giving you a call so that maybe we can talk as you move through your study about how things are going. Yeah. And if I could add, uh, if, you, if you're listening and you would like to hear uh, Dr. Dozier on the show uh, as well, just email family at mpbonline.org. Let us know that you're interested and would like to hear her and uh if uh, because i'm sure that we still have plenty of listeners that are suffering from this sort of uh disorder absolutely okay well let's move on um and like i said we'll talk more about hoarding in the future but we're going to move on to our show about worry or anxiety um, is it just worry or is it full-blown anxiety disorder? We did that on July the 11th, 2023. And um, I'll turn it over to you now, Abram, to, to take it for Wesley. All right. Wesley says, can friends who cannot handle stress whatsoever stress you out? I say yes. Knowing what you can or cannot control is key. The serenity prayer is not just to start AA meetings. And if you want, Doc, I can, I can, I've got the serenity prayer right here. If you want me to read that. Yeah, go ahead and read it. I think it'd be good for our listeners. All right. It says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying it one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. Now, a lot of that is very religious, the last half, but still, even if you're not a religious person, that first half and you know so much of that is very helpful to someone um, as far as giving me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Yeah, absolutely. And and like you said, whether you're religious or not, if you if you can get your brain to get to the point where you truly can accept things that you can't change and move forward, you know, it's just it's it's all part of just centering yourself and and realizing what and who you are and who you can be. If you don't let yourself get paralyzed by spinning your wheels on things that that you can't change and and to accept things as they are. And and then I like the living one day at a time. Um, again, that same old thing of, of keeping yourself in the present will keep your mind on the important things in the here and now and not having you worry about the past or the future. So, you know, anxiety is a normal reaction to stress. And and actually, we talk about this all the time. It can be beneficial in some situations. It obviously can alert us to dangers, help us prepare and pay attention. A little anxiety is good. A lot is not good because it will mess up your performance. A little is good. And if you talk to any performer, any any motivational speaker, any actor, any singer, any musician, they typically will tell you 
that yes, they get extremely ang anxious right before their performance. They they get this rush of adrenaline, so to speak, and and then when they get out on the stage, it tends to go away, and then you tend to settle into very focused performance. So that's why a little anxiety is good. Yeah. If but, I could add something really quick, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Sure. Um, I had a pastor who previously in the past told me that when you feel a little anxious about something like, you know, going in front of people like that, it's God telling you that whatever you're about to do is important. Now, again, I have to go back and say, um, even if you're not religious, it's, it's whatever, it's your body telling you that whatever you're about to do is important. It's, it's your in tune with yourself right. telling you that what you're doing is significant into your life and maybe even to other people's lives. Exactly. That's a, I think that's a beautiful way to put it in that uh, it, because it's important, then you are able to focus. And that is exactly what the, the release of those hormones does. The, it, it helps you focus. Um, you don't want the fight or flight to go on too long, or or you really will um, bail on things, but it helps you um, perform better. So, but, you know, anxiety disorders are different from the normal feelings of that nervousness or anxiousness. And about probably 30% of adults at some point in their lives feel significant enough anxiety that they turn into a disorder. Um, there are a lot of treatments that are available. Many are not medication. Many are um, therapies that help you learn how to control the emotions so they don't get into overdrive, so to speak. Um, whether that's meditation or cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever. But and I will say in children, we recommend that um, above medication. In adults, many times we, we recommend uh, therapy in addition to. But the sooner you intervene on, on anxiety, the better off you can be. Yeah, and, and if, um, uh, yeah, I, I do want to clarify with like what I was saying. I guess that could kind of be more compared to like how we were defining anxiety as like stage anxiety, that sort of thing. Anxiety disorders are very much a different thing as far as uh, how we had defined it a second ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And if you'll go back and um, listen to the show on July 11th, 2023, it talks in depth about the definition of a true anxiety disorder and um, obsessive compulsive disorders come under that. Uh, there are uh, phobias uh, and, and other things that come under the umbrella of anxiety disorders. And then actually we've had probably three or four shows over the last many years on anxiety. If you want to go check your your podcast. Do that so if you want or need more information on anxiety disorders. And I, I don't want to minimize the utility of medication when, when you are kind of over the edge and really in need of some help that even allows you to participate in the therapeutic modality. Sometimes that is necessary. And, and there are many primary care physicians who are pretty well equipped to help with that. So I would encourage um, any of you who are struggling with anxiety to, to look into that. And then the, the last thing I'll say back to Will's comment about can, can people uh, around you increase your stress? Can friends who cannot handle stress whatsoever stress you out and and obviously the answer is yes and because if you are continually bombarded by somebody's anxiety and somebody's problems that are unrelenting and they keep 
handing it over to you to try to help them handle, then yes, you know, it's again, back to the emotional contagion. You will ultimately start feeling stressed yourself. And so to keep in mind, if you find that that individual is making your anxiety or feelings of stress worse, then I would encourage you to distance yourself from that person a bit, but first to suggest that they get help and give them some possible ways to obtain help. Um, I'm not saying that you should turn away from a friend in need, but you need to make sure that those friends in need don't use you as a crutch and are leaning on you to your detriment. And I think many of us out there probably allow people to lean on, on you to your detriment. So think about that. It is not a selfish act to suggest that an individual get professional help and then that you distance yourself a little bit if you find that it is causing a negative response in you. It's important. Okay. We have time. We're going to get to, I think we're going to be able to get to this last email that we wanted to cover, Abram. Um, and it's, uh, it was our show. We've done several, but we did a show this year on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD on April 18th, 2023. And, um, so Abram, I'll, turn the email over to you. Yes, ma'am. Well, this says, I am one of those people who probably has ADHD. I tuned in late, so you may have addressed this already. I was an elementary school art teacher. My special ed teacher friend once said to me after observing me through faculty meetings, you are classic ADD. She was basing this on doodling through faculty meetings, fidgeting, shuffling through papers, etc. She had, of course, also observed my classroom. I guess my question is, I have always coped pretty well in life. I was smart enough to know, or smart enough to adapt my own coping skills for the most part. I did have problems with procrastination. Is there any benefit to actually getting clinically diagnosed? And that is from Melissa. Melissa, that is such a great question. It really is. And it does sound like you had an astute friend who maybe was watching you because as we age, those who have ADHD most have some amount of that hyperactivity component. Um, it may be more inattentive stuff, but the hyperactivity component, and many times in girls, and I see Melissa, I'm uh, making an assumption that you are a woman, that um, that many times women are less of that overt hy hyperactivity and more of exactly what your um, friend um, noticed, the fidgety, the fidgetiness and, and the, the internal focusing on ways to keep it still. One of my older patients actually in um, clinic recently um, talked to me about the fact that he found that he was constantly moving his hands around, fiddling with his fingers when he was sitting still. And we talked about the fact that he's learned to control the, the urge to jump up by moving his fingers rather than, you know, moving his legs and jumping up out of his seat. Um, as we age, we also, our ADHD tends to get better in that we learn to do what we need to do to focus ourselves better. Um, interestingly enough, um, that special ed teacher who was watching you, you mentioned that you're an art teacher. And that is, is not unusual in an individual who decided to go into teaching with ADHD. Because um, in art, um, as a teacher, you can be more active and have more movement. You probably enjoyed... Um, 
your art classes more than anything else because you are involved in that physical movement and creation. So you are actively learning something rather than passively learning something. In art classes, typically you don't just sit there and listen to a teacher, but you're doing something as you are learning. So all of that is is really interesting to me. Now, back to your question. Is there any benefit of actually getting clinically diagnosed? Maybe. Um, uh, at this point, depending on how you are, it how old you are, um, because there is some evidence that has been ongoing looking at individuals with attentional problems as they age, and and it it could potentially get a little worse. It tends to get better in middle life. You learn your coping skills. But um, as we age, all of us have a little bit more difficulty in concentrating and everything. And if you see that things are getting worse for you, then it might be a good idea to go see someone who is very well versed in ADHD, not just somebody who throws medicine at you, who can step through um whether or not this would be a good idea. It sounds like you've picked a good career. It sounds like um, you've learned to in, internally um, control your movements. Procrastination is absolutely one of those issues that occurs in individuals with ADHD. And if that is getting in the way of day-to-day -day life and causing problems with you, like not getting your taxes paid or whatever, um, then maybe get an evaluation. Okay. Um, I'm going to take the last minute because there was a quick email I almost didn't get to. I want to go over it real quick. Long time listener here. And I was so sad to hear about Sue from Beaumont. I love how she would consistently call into all the shows and have thoughtful questions. So I wanted to one more Beaumont, Sue from Beaumont. And then she also um, just made some very uh, positive comments. This is Jennifer Ringo about Mississippi. She moved back to teach in the Delta and how she loves being back and being able to make a difference. So um, thank you so much for the, all those emails. I appreciate all of you so much in contributing. And listeners, go listen to this show or any of those podcasts. Uh, you can go listen on your favorite podcast app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.